Welcome to App Talk with Uptick, where we dig into the nitty gritty of how to grow apps and games. We speak with industry experts about specific strategies, tools, and tactics they use to find success. And we keep you up to date with emerging news and trends in the ever changing marketing, games, and technology ecosystem. My name is Andrew Agosta, Director of Marketing here at Uptick. And joining me today are my co host, Warren Woodward, co founder of Uptick. And our guest. Hi, Thomas Hopkins. I go by T Hop and COO of Perfect Storm Gaming Hi. Studio. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, T Hop. Uh, excited to be back. It's been a couple months, so quite a bit to cover. Yeah, did, did anything happen? Did anything happen <laughs> the last couple months? I don't think we really missed much, did we? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of an interesting time for us to take a little bit of a break. I think I basically called the top of the crypto ecosystem on our last episode and then we had a yeah, time it's, it's not like all of tech gaming and crypto all you know crashed in the last uh the last few weeks so or the last probably no weekend. news yeah probably no news to talk about today right yeah so we got a few articles um we're trying to keep it brief but we have like eight so we'll try and speed through them um we're going to start with something that's sort of relevant to our more traditional mobile audience, and we'll transition to market conditions as well. And then and on Web3 has been a huge focus of us. So um, to start with the most boring and technical uh, topic of the whole set, um, first thing I want to talk about is uh, Apple's worldwide developer, worldwide developer Conference and their announcement of Scan 4.0. Um, I'll link to some articles that are do a much better job of explaining this in detail than I will here today, um, but I want to sort of cover the key features of Scan 4.0 because it's really relevant to anyone who's doing mobile marketing. Um, so at Scan 4.0 that was announced at WWDC has basically four key features. Um, it has a what's called a hierarchical source identifier, a hierarchical, hierarchical conversion value, a multi, new multiple conversion values, and a scan ad network attribution for web. Okay, so I'm gonna go into detail, but I guess like if we take a step back and talk about what's important at a high level is like they're actually making scan usable. And that's good because it means we can do mobile marketing on iOS, which is something that has not happened or has been difficult to do without fingerprinting for the previous year or so. Okay, so just really quickly, what are each of the components of this? Uh, hierarch hierarchical source data, which is previously campaign data, has, will increase our the potential number of uh, digits that we have access to from two to four. What does that mean? Basically, if we talk about what historically, we've basically had one campaign ID at first scan, which gives you sort of high level information about what's available within a campaign. With the hierarchical scores data, we are basically able to see in scan, ad set, and then creative combinations. It's a little more complicated and nuanced than that. Basically, what this means is going forward, scan will have the ability, if you have enough data, to give you all the granularity from the campaign all the way down to the creative ad set. Obviously, this is really important for being able to optimize mobile campaigns. Number two, we have multiple conversion uh, conversion data points anchored to specific days. So now we'll have a conversion data that's passed through on D2, D7, and D35. What does this mean? We can measure cohorts as they mature over time. That's important. There's also no more stupid timer system, which is which makes it really difficult for uh, to measure how installs are, are flowing. That's through huge. System. It's a huge, it's a huge deal. Okay. Getting close to the end, and we can talk about what the, you know, sort of the implication. Uh, one final piece is a hierarchical conversion value. What this basically means is Previously, we had conversion data that was either nothing or you'd get um, you know, some amount if you had really high uh, data velocity. What that effectively meant is most campaigns had zero conversion data. Now what you're gonna have is some level of granularity uh, at, for most campaign installs, which is really important. Basically, if we take a step back, what this means is uh, most installs, you'll get, either some in, you'll get some indicator of how valuable the user is. And last but not least, um, we have the introduction of web to app scan attribution. So there's a lot of stuff. Um, we can talk about what we think is important. I think the most important piece of it also is they've clarified fingerprinting is never allowed. So if you're doing fingerprinting, you will eventually be slapped in the face by Apple. Thoughts? There is a lot to unpack here. I mean, <laughs> yeah. the on the, on the optimistic, there's an optimistic and pessimistic view here, right? On the optimistic side, uh, it's great to see that they've actually listened to industry feedback. I mean, I think they've there's plenty of evidence that like Apple's felt this on the their bottom line too. From you know when you basically turn off the marketing arm of the the that entire industry, um, you're going to see revenues go down. So I think combination of us kicking and screaming and them seeing their the material impact at Apple uh, has led to this. But it's great to see ongoing development. These are all smart changes. It it, it has the tone of they actually spoke and worked with someone that understands these things. Um, on a more pessimistic side, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, <laughs> uh, I think uh, there was a lot more expectation that prior versions of Scan were going to be a lot more 
usable and practical than they actually were in practice. And so I'm going to take that same approach here. I do think the likelihood of this being um, not bad enough to get the job done is is much more more likely. I mean, in the in the meantime, like at, at Uptick, like we 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 basically have like made our own. I don't want to say workaround, but like hybrid methodology that's been like super reliable for iOS using some deterministic, some scan. Probably not pivoting from that anytime soon has been working super well. Uh, T Hop, do you, did, did, did you miss uh, mobile UA and uh, dealing with scan in your time away from <laughs> from that part of the industry? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I'm taking a little bit of a, a different approach here, and my thoughts on it is, uh, you know, the my belief is that this is all going to get sorted out through legislation and just uh you know antitrust and all that um going on right now and i think it's you know i'm taking more or less a a little bit of a hiatus hiatus or a break for the next you know year or two until this gets sorted out but my understanding is um i agree with you that this is an effort by apple to you know try to get a little bit more revenue coming back in because when spend goes down, which is what's happened, spend went down because CPIs went up. Um, then, you know, spend goes down on the advertising, you know, the, the mark companies and the apps marketing. So then Apple's revenue goes down and, you know, so it's, a uh, it's an obvious change on why they're doing that. It's, um, it's fun watching for me, all the, what I call smoke and mirrors, on this, oh, it's about privacy. And yeah. the reality is it's really about the bottom line for Apple. Um, and this is their strongest business unit at this point um, in terms of profitability and, and it's growing and you know where their hardware sales have been going down. So this is, this is I, I just, I've loved the spectator uh, to watch as a spectator being like, this is all about, you know they're hiding behind privacy, but the reality is it's, it's you just got to follow the money trail. Yeah, I mean, it gives them we've talked about this ad nauseum, so we don't need to rehash this a lot. I, I very much agree with your perspective. I mean, I think also two things can be true. They can, if, if incidentally they end up providing more privacy to users, great. <laughs> um, but I think realistic, realistically what they're doing is creating a like moat around user data that they're going to have in house. And that, you know, that's going to be really, really meaningful long-term as they develop an ad network. And it's just like, we know it's the most valuable thing that's exists in tech. So yeah, I'd, skeptical I'd love reasonable. to, I'd love to hear you guys take on how much you really think this is, going to affect you know if i say let's give an example if cpa cpas let's say went from let's say you know cost per paying or cost per subscriber let's say went from being let's say fifty dollars on average across different networks um pre-att to um you know, $150. <laughs> you know, that's like kind of the average what people saw. I was like, oh my God, like, you know, cost to acquire a paying customer went up 3x, 4x um, for a lot of advertisers. How much of a how much do you think this will help? Like if you guys were to guess um in its ability to bring that 3x maybe down to 2x. Um, and obviously spend levels came down a lot. So not only did CPIs go up, but spend levels came down a lot too. And CPI still, or CPA still went up. So what, where, how much do you think this, this level of granularity will help? Um, for me, I'm, I'm pessimistic. I, I believe it's not going to help much. All it's going to do is make us feel like we have a little bit better idea of what's going on. But the reality is the ability to uh, benefit from everybody else's data and all the other advertisers' data and essentially make all of our, you know, what we used to be doing was all retargeting. It was all retargeting because we were benefiting from everybody else's data and everybody else was benefiting from our data. And, um, you know, whether everybody really realized that's what was going on or not, that's what was happening. And, um, and now we don't have that anymore and that's not coming back. So, um, how do we, you know, how do, how do you, how much do you think this additional granularity is going to help? It's a good question. I think there's a few pieces. So I think let's, let's caveat that it's a year from now, this is completely rolled out and then adopted by all that tech all the ad platforms so mmps as well as then rolls back to the ad networks i mean i think the i think there is meaningful improvement here and i don't know what the conversion what, what the increase in conversion value looks like um but i think it, for people like warren and i whose job it is to use the incremental data we have to provide incremental value to our clients i think this is a huge opportunity because it's going to be it, it's complicated and it'll give us a differentiation and so i'm i'm cautiously optimistic that a year from now we'll be able to do better marketing overall and you talked about you know tripling in 
cost per payer, that going from triple to doubling, that might be someone's profit margin. So I think what it does is it makes some amount of uh, some amount of products more viable. Now, how much of impact does it have on the ecosystem overall? <laughs> we will see. I don't know. Um, but I do, I am, I would say, costly optimistic, and I am a huge Apple critic, but costly optimistic that given a year from now, I think this does make some businesses more viable, which is really critical for this ecosystem to flourish. I don't know, Warren, do you have thoughts? Yeah, the, the one comment I would add, I don't think the the point you threw out was necessarily wrong, uh, Tihab, but um, one thing that I've found in just talking to a bunch of developers is that people just are without a accurate way or even remotely accurate way to quantify the current profitability of their iOS. So like on paper, if you just look at what's attributed, what, well, one thing I've seen particularly with larger companies is they have so much infrastructure built around the way things have traditionally been measured. And in that infrastructure, yeah, your, your cost went up by three, they went up by 10 or 20 in some, in some cases we even saw. That's not the reality. Like we, we, we most common, I'll see one of two things. They have that kind of methodology of still trying to uh, kind of use the old system for measurement because they have all of their finances built around that, or they're taking an all-in view um, and just looking at you know all-in uh, return over cost. Neither of these is a super healthy way to do it. So what we saw with a lot of people is just sort of like analysis paralysis of like, I, the numbers I can look at look really bad. Uh, I don't have an accurate or better idea of how to quantify this. So I guess I got to shut it down or someone's telling me I got to shut it down. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm always an advocate of, um, you know, obviously looking at all the different data points. So how did you hear about us? Pixel based, MMM yeah. based, you know, MMM based, um, media mix model. Mm -hmm. And what I can say is the clients that I did consulting for, as well as the companies that I work for Lyft masterclass, um, like we did, we did see like it changed like overnight. Um, yeah. and that's, but yes, you're right. It wasn't as bad as the actual networks were showing or the MMPs were showing, but it was still, still bad, but yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the difficulty is quantifying how bad it is and understanding where to deploy capital. And that's the piece that got pulled. This, everyone's just shooting in the dark. Okay, I'd love to talk about this more, but we have a lot to cover. So <laughs> we're going to move on. Um, I will say, I will give a shout out here. Uh, there's a really good interview that came out on Monday. Um, Eric Sufer interviewed the head of one of the head of strategy of branch and they go really, really deep into this. So if you're curious about scan, we'll link to that interview. It's about an hour long, but definitely worth checking out if you want to get into the nitty gritty much more than I will dare to do. Okay. Let's uh let's do the next the other Apple piece next actually while we're while we're on it. I go think. for it. So yeah, okay, cool. So yeah, I want to touch on a pair of articles that I'd say tangentially tied to the first and uh some of T Hop's comments. So this is all about uh cloud and, and streaming games. Um the first is an uh, article from Tech Radar. Uh, Xbox Game Pass on Samsung TVs feels like cloud gaming's tipping point. Uh, so quick, some quick pull quotes. Uh, as part of its What's Next for Gaming briefing, Microsoft announced that from June 30th, Samsung 2022 smart TVs will feature a Samsung Gaming Hub app that will let you stream any Xbox cloud gaming enabled on a Game Pass Ultimate account to your TV and play them with a controller via Bluetooth. While the game catalog uh, will only have about 100 games initially, it will grow from there. Uh, and then a quote from Microsoft VP, uh, Ashley McKissick. Uh, she said, uh, she confirmed that this partnership with Samsung is just the first the company is planning and said intent is to explore other TV partnerships as part of its next evolution in our vision. So in case, just to make sure it wasn't lost in that summary, you do not need, uh, you do not need an, an Xbox yeah. to, to do the streaming. You just have to have a Game Pass, Game Pass account. So this is kind of huge. Um, and then this is tied to uh, a piece from 9to5Mac. Uh, the headline is cloud gaming ban on the app store and mandatory WebKit, kit, mandatory WebKit usage, both declared anti-competitive. So Apple's ban on cloud gaming services in the app store and its insistence that all iOS browser apps must use its own WebKit browser engine have both been declared to be anti-competitive by the UK competition watchdog. Uh, this announcement follows a year long investigation. The UK's Competition and Market Authority, or CMA, carried out an investigation into antitrust complaints against Apple and Google and has announced its findings. It says both companies restrict comp competition. Uh, the study found that Apple and Google have effective duopoly on mobile ecosystems that allows them to exercise a stranglehold over these markets, which include operating system, app stores, web browsers, and mobile devices. And then one key thing from the actual findings, uh, they said, without interventions, both companies are likely to maintain and even strengthen their grip over the sector, further restricting competition and limiting incentives for innovators. 
Uh, the CMA also concluded Apple's exclusion of cloud gaming services harms both developers and consumers. They said, Apple has blocked the emergence of cloud gaming services on its app store. Like web apps, cloud gaming services are develop developing innovation, providing mobile access to high quality games that can be streamed rather than individually downloaded. Gaming apps are a key source of revenue for Apple and cloud gaming could pose a real threat to Apple's strong position in app distribution. By preventing this sector from growing, Apple risks causing mobile users to miss out on the full benefit of cloud gaming. Okay, so I uh, would love to get you guys thoughts on this. Um, you know, I wanted to pair these articles because it seemed clear a that cloud gaming is finally maybe arrived in a, a really compelling way, but also that Apple's uh, resistance to allowing this, uh, there's now you know, maybe some reason to think that that could crack. So love your thoughts on just the current state of cloud gaming and what if, if this does come to pass that we can you know stream cloud gaming, on mobile devices, what does this mean for the app and play stores? I'll I'll kick it off. Um, obviously, launching new titles and working at a you know gaming studio, you you do a lot of research on you know Sensor Tower and different places to really understand you know where are the opportunities and cloud gaming is a place that we looked into. Um, Red, if you haven't checked out New Zoo, New Zoo's got some good articles um, in there. But basically, the, the take here, it's very small still. Uh, but what the real benefit of cloud gaming is, is on low-end devices. Yeah. So in the U.S., it's not something we have an issue with, right? In the U.S., people have iPhones. They've got, you know, your latest Pixel. Um, and even the lower-end devices are still pretty high-end. Contrast that with phones in LATAM, phones in Southeast Asia, phones in India. India is one of the fastest growing markets. Um, and when you look at the phones they have there, the total size of the actual hardware storage is like 10 gigs or 20 gigs. Right. And that's like your standard phone. Um, and it's so that the cost of those devices are low. And what I, what I think you'll, and so when you go take games that are core games that are two, three gigabytes, and then the actual software to run the phone is another, you know, five, 10 gigabytes. Then people actually have to have the decision of, do I download this game or do I have my like finance app on my phone? Right. And right. so that, that's a real problem. Um, and if you look at games like Mobile Legends Bang Bang that, did, that was very popular, one of the biggest reasons it was popular, not just because it was, you know, filling the demand of, you know, League of Legends on a mobile phone back in 2017, 18, when it launched, the biggest reason was that it, it was really small. It was right. like 100 gigabytes or 100 megabytes. And so I think this, this evolution of cloud gaming could be really big. It's just a matter of how, is it too early? Are we, is it three years out? Is it five years out? Because I think the real benefit is on low-end devices. Yeah. I, I still think people are going to love playing in the US on their consoles, you know, on their laptops. Um, so, and I also think it's, it's just, we don't know how long it's going to take. We have predictions for how long it's going to take for our, uh, you know, for the fiber optic cable and the, you know, connections to be strong enough that the ping times are, are, are good. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with basically everything you said. I think, you know, cloud gaming has been the next big thing in gaming for 10 years. Right. So, and it's, it's, it hasn't, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, I think you sort of touched on this though, what it's really going to do is expand the market to more and more gamers. And that I think yes. in the games industry, that's a net positive. The Samsung TV thing is kind of interesting because basically if you buy a TV, you can buy a $60 controller and play Xbox games with a subscription. That's pretty cool, especially because it's like hard to get a PS5 still. So like maybe, they, you know, there may be, what, that, what that's basically doing is, is making the pie bigger, which, you know, if we are in the games industry, it's a good thing. Although to be clear, it's making Microsoft's pie bigger. It's not really helping anybody else. So uh, maybe there's some other issues with the anti-competition there. Um, bringing this back to the Apple WebKit article, I mean, Jesus. It's Apple just doing the same thing over and over and over again, and we're still surprised. This one, they can't even argue privacy. This is just clear monopolistic practices. Now, is, is the European Commission going to be able to do anything about this? I mean, I freaking hope so, <laughs> but, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, great points, both of you guys. I mean, just just one thought, really just echoing what you both said. I mean, one reason that that our team's always been just so bullish on mobile as a segment is just simply the addressable market, you know, and everyone being able to play a game developed for mobile versus something developed for PS5 or a high-end PC. Um, and I think it's really exciting what it can mean for like the fidelity of of uh, mass market games, just that 
you know, basically like raising the floor of, of fidelity uh, and, and size that a game could have while still being played by, you know, in the future, like with the caveats that, that Tiop said uh, about like having good enough connections, but raising that floor and having games with that could be super, super appealing, super high fidelity that almost anyone could play. I mean, it's, it's a nice vision for the future. We'll see if it pans out. Yeah, okay, um, moving on. So the elephant in the room is just the market conditions of the last couple months. The stock market has obviously taken a big dive, especially focused on tech stocks. I think we're officially in technical recession as of yesterday. So great, congratulations, everyone. Don't look at your portfolio. Um, and then the obvious other thing is the dro giant drop off in crypto asset value over the last couple months, weeks, but also days has <laughs> dropped pretty precipitously. Um, and so that's just, you know, we're calling this what crypto winter four or something. Is I don't know. That, anyway, maybe you guys talk about that a little bit better. Um, so there are a couple of articles I just wanted to touch on. I don't think anything that we're about to touch on is like really, really relevant or they're good case studies. It's not like any you know, huge macro trends, but it's a couple of things I just want to call out as um, I just think they're, they're interesting uh, case studies in the fallacy of tech companies as it relates to uh, the macroeconomic trends we've seen. So number one is an article uh, called, I think it's Seeking Alpha article, skill stock colon a financial disaster. So I'll just briefly touch on this. Um, a few, a really short quote, the poster child of the SPAC craze has cratered with the stock down over 96% from its all-time high last year. Skills financials are a disaster with revenue growth slowing significantly, expenses skyrocketing, and stock-based compensation getting out of control. There's a lot in this article. It's really funny. I highly recommend you going to read it. Um, I think skills is like basically the ultimate Ponzi scheme when it comes to mobile games marketing. If you looked at it, they're basically never profitable in any metric and they have accelerating losses. Most of their game developers are never profitable. And I sort of call this out over and over again over the last couple of months. So this is just me being an asshole and doing victory lap to say, ha ha ha, look at what's happening. These stock, the stock is down from like 44 at its peak to like a dollar 30. Read the article. I mean, Warren, you, you did some poking around. Do you, have, do you have any thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, this is really, to me, like a case study in financial engineering on multiple fronts. Um, one uh, one number that I pulled out was that their just their sales and marketing expenses was up 22% year over year. Um, and the sales and marketing expenses alone was 20% greater than all of the revenue generated by the company. <laughs> Um, it was also like their general and administrative costs was 99% uh, the total revenue of the company. So it just seems like, I don't know. Oh, and, and Xander, can you can you summarize what happened with like the CEO stock-based compensation? I thought that was wild. Yeah, so there's like a, a one-time fee for 65 million in like a uh, one-time stock payout. And what happened was, I think what my understanding of what happened is the CEO missed his comp package. So he wasn't getting his payout from stock from the stock. Uh, because he didn't hit his numbers and they basically gave him a, a comp package of 65 million stock options anyway to make up for the fact that he misses incentive bonus which is just the ultimate like what the fuck are we doing here guys uh, anyway i don't know we can move on for that i just like if you if you want to see like some shite for it at dumpster fire please read this article any do you have any thoughts here i'll just uh you know i was i used to be in the casino space um and then in we we are our company uh, the company i was working for bill gelpie's company rocket games bill and steven's company rocket games got acquired by penn national and so then there was a lot of talk about oh what's the skills company doing this looks interesting um back then was there you know penn national was getting to real money gambling online and um and the, the interesting thing i always the, the thing i always like to do in any situation like this is to build up to build a warrant is i just go on google like why is skills or what is skills and then i look at what the top google things are that show up mm -hmm. and i also look at google trends to see how it's 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 doing but like the top things that show up are why is skills stop dropping stock so low stock going down going down down stock down stock drop <laughs> like when you talk about social engineering everything is about like financially related to it it's not like about the game it's right. not about you know, like how to use the product better. Like it's not about the players. Like you said, it's about financial engineering. It's about gambling. And so I would, I would second that opinion. And whenever you have products like that, that aren't about fun entertainment and more, and it's just about financial engineering, it's going to be hard for it to be sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so the continuing on, uh, we have one other article. Uh, touch on it briefly. I'm a little bit more sober about this because this is when I actually think it's a reasonably good company. So the message, is, the article is a message from Coinbase CEO and co-founder Brian Armstrong. Uh, the pull, the critical pull quote is today I'm making the critical the difficult decision to reduce the size of our team by 80% to ensure we stay healthy during this economic downturn. Why? Uh, economic conditions are changing rapidly. We're trying to manage our co managing our costs is critical and down markets and we grew too quickly. Uh, they basically called out that they need to manage expenses and they need to increase efficiency. So it's a really interesting article. I mean, Coinbase is basically the one of the darlings of Silicon Valley, like VC tech over the last, what, 10 years or so. And like, it's a, it's a good product. I use Coinbase or I use Coinbase Pro now to, if I want to buy and sell crypto, I don't do a lot of that these days, but you, you know, it's, it does a decent job for that. Uh, it's pretty interesting though, in that they basically admitted that, well, one, the macroeconomic conditions are changing. Everyone knows that we just touched on that. Uh, I think like the critically thing is like, they admitted they just grew way too fast. And this was just a, a relic of the the OPM that was happening over the last 10 years. Basically, we had zero interest rates. Everyone was, everyone was investing super aggressively. There was so much money sloshing around. They just kept hiring. And the thing that they sort of called out is like, they weren't actually shipping more products despite the fact that they had more people. And that's sort of the crazy thing is like, they basically their inefficiency ballooned as their product, as their teams ballooned. And that's something that's like the flip side of like, why you should just keep hiring when, when you have money. It's like, you need to keep be able to ship products. Uh, otherwise it's, Otherwise, there's no freaking point. You're just increasing your, uh, your expenses. So uh, a little bit more somber here. I know there's a lot, like, a lot of smart people who work here. Um, what do you guys think about this, this piece? Uh, I saw a really good chip post on it this morning. Um, it was a Twitter account called uh, at Trolldart, who said, uh, lost, lost three of my remote jobs at Coinbase today. <laughs> That's pretty good. But I think it just, it, it, it's funny, but it also just speaks to sort of that lack of efficiency that can happen um, when you start growing at a pace, uh, company culture really changes certain thresholds. Like for, for our team, just like crossing around 20 people made it start feeling like a completely different company and we needed yeah. infrastructure that we didn't need before. And uh, yeah, that, I don't really have any great insights. I think it's you know doing what you have to do in light of, of market conditions. T-Hop, any, any thoughts here? I'm actually, uh, I'm impressed. I don't know him. I don't, I don't, but this is the first article I've read, written or I've read. Um, and I'm impressed that he's actually be, like standing by that. This is my fault. This was my call. This is my decision now. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm calling it out rather than kind of pointing fingers mm -hmm. or making excuses. And um, I think it, it, it speaks to probably what, you know, the leadership might, I'm hoping the leadership might be like there, but um, I love the transparency I, I appreciated the, the article and I appreciated how it was written. And, uh, you know, I, I, either it's great PR <laughs> or it's just, <clears throat> it's a, it's a solidly run company or solidly run C, you know, CEO that's making the right decisions. I think in this time, um, I, for one have experienced what it's like when you scale. I mean, I was at Lyft on its way to IPO and I joined as employee number 2,500 heading up the passenger acquisition growth. And I was there for one year. By the time I left, we were 6,000 employees. That's wild. And I was just like, the, I can tell you, it felt like that meme where there's a guy standing in a house and everything's on fire. And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> and everything's okay. And that's, that's what it felt like. Um, and when you talk about it, inefficiencies, oh my gosh, we still got a lot done. It was wild how much got done, but it was on the backs of long, long hours doing things mm -hmm. that like creating lots of buy-in, et cetera. And it's, it's hard when you scale like that and cultures have culture has trouble, you know, efficiencies go down. So I, I empathize with that. And I think, you know, he's making the right decisions. Yeah. 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 There's a lot more here um, about Coinbase. There's some really interesting stuff about how he approached uh, work culture, especially around like Black Lives Matter. A really interesting topic. I don't think we have time for it right now. Um, we're going to do one last article and then pivot to our main uh, main topic. Luckily, this article is a nice bridge to our main topic. So Warren, take it away with this incredibly intelligent and uh, not at all biased Bloomberg article. Yeah, so uh, Uptick uh, partner, Axie Infinity, uh, we have to address this. I think that they, they were in the subject of a Bloomberg piece that went pretty viral over the last few days. Um, the, the headline for this piece is uh, a billion dollar crypto gaming startup promised riches and delivered disaster. So a pretty sensational headline. Um, I read this article like three times and I was really searching for what was the promising of, of riches from, from Axie here. 
I would say that there's like pretty non-existent evidence that they uh, present here. So like, I mean, the most compelling thing I could find was they took this quote from Jiho, uh, one of the co-founders who said, we believe in a world future where work and play become one. Uh, we believe in empowering our players and giving them economic opportunities. Welcome to the revolution. So, I mean, that's speaking to financial empowerment and a vision there, but this is a long way from saying like, oh, we promise you buy this asset, number go up, make money. Um, yeah, and just to read one other poll quote from the article, um, as Sky Mavis's revolutionary rhetoric began to look increasingly hollow, the company shifted its story. In December, it quietly altered its mission statement, deleting the phrase play to earn and replacing with the mushier play and earn. Uh, days after it, the hack, it launched Axie Origin, a long awaited new version with upgraded graphics and tweaks to the gameplay. Crucially, this iteration doesn't involve cryptocurrencies at all because Sky Mavis has acknowledged that many players are willing to engage with the new game only if the complications of crypto are removed. The plan is for Origin to supplant the original game with the non crypto version, attracting a broad, place of, broad base of players. So, I wanted to call that quote out too because it's it's just factually untrue. Like that, you know, we're we're working on Axie Origin. It's 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 in a beta that doesn't have crypto in it, but that's not the vision for the product. Like it's going to be a hybrid product. If you want to play it as free to play, traditional way you can play it that way. If you want to use you know blockchain owned assets, you'll be able to do that as well. And the call out from switching to play to earn to play and earn seems like very nitpicky and not really much of a smoking gun. So I don't know. So I, the, the whole reason we want to call this out is like there's a headline to this article that's very sensational and alludes that there's some kind of scandal. But I encourage everyone to read the article. I don't think there's really much of a scandal here. Like, yes, the assets got inflated. People bought it at the top. They lost money. Um, but to insinuate that the Sky Mavis team was promising riches, promising returns here, I think is uh, completely unfair and you know, completely lacks, lacks evidence. Um, another thing I wanna call out is that, uh, you know, Axie's growth to date, everything's been organic. Like we, like our team is going to start doing paid advertising for them, you know, in the months ahead uh, when Origin fully launches. But this is to, so to insinuate that there was like big messaging around this uh, and, and the earnings I think is also disingenuous. And I can also say like, as the team that's making the ads for them, it's a concerted decision that we're not speaking to earning potential, that you're going to make money off of playing the game. Um, that's both both our team and Sky Mavis themselves really do not want to highlight that that's a reason to play the game. Um, and that's another frustrating thing about this article is they alternate between a, accusing Axie of having a play to earn economy and then accusing them of pivoting away from that and uh, just positioning it as a game first and play to earn second. So they've kind of there's it's lose lose the way that they're positioning it. There's not really a path that they approve of for Axie, you know, both positioning play to earn and moving away from that. So I don't know, it's a very frustrating piece. Uh, and one thing I think about a lot when I read something like this is do we see exposés on free to play games, you know, when people spend lots of money in them and there's just zero chance of recouping anything? No, not really. Well, I mean, have you read about Diablo Mortal recently? Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> touche, touche. Um, and then we did reach out to, to uh, Quinn, uh, the marketing lead at Axie, for just a, a response on this. And I do have a quote for, from him. Um, so a uh, response from the Axie team here. Uh, they said, unfortunately, less than favorable press comes with the territory of being in a bear market. In regards to the article, like with any play and earn game, there are community members like the person profiled who play solely for economic reasons. But what's missing from the story is the fact that hundreds of thousands of players come for the gameplay and community. Yes, DAUs of V2 are down, but we recently launched Axie Infinity Origin Alpha Access and numbers are strong. Even without token incentives or being accessible via the app stores. We're busy working toward a global launch this year, which will include being integrated into app stores. We were born in a bear market and we'll continue to build through this one. Thriving in tough times is our superpower. So anyway, that's that's all I wanted to touch on as far as like a summary of the article. I, obviously we're very biased. We work closely with Axie and we love that team, but I do encourage people read the article, see if you think that it has innate bias, draw your own conclusions from it. Um, guys, what, what do you think about, did you have a chance to check out this Bloomberg piece? What's your, what's your take on uh, you know, their, their, their assessment of, of Axie in the state of play and earn? My opinion is that it's hard to be first. Um, and I mean, look at, 
just look at what their success did to this entire ecosystem. Yeah. Like it's amazing. Um, and you know, we obviously have an opinion. We did a lot of research when we started the gaming company, this, this studio, we didn't think we were going to go into, you know, web three or even look at web three. Um, and we were looking at instant games. We we're looking at all the different types of console, everything. And we basically ended up at this place where like, Hey, there's some interesting, um, things here that, that actually can make the community and game economies better if they're done right. And the hard part about building a game economy or building a new economy that has any, you know, implications outside of a game, um, it's hard. There are so many, there's hundreds of variables you have to consider. And I would say that like they did their best and knowing now what they learned, they're coming out with a new game. And I, I love that. That's, that's, that's learning from what, you know, what happened and, and trying to build upon it. And that's, you know, that's not something that you can see the future on when you're de developing something brand new. Um, and so, yeah, there's going to be lots of companies that come and go in this space. Um, but I, I, what I, what I love is the, the fact that they're, they're innovating and they're trying um, and they're setting, they're, they're charting that, they're charting that course and, and, and kind of, and yeah, out there in front to make room for, you know, new companies to come in and also try to innovate in this space. So I, I, I think it's, it's hard. I mean, I think his message, the marketing league's message is right. Like in a bear market, there's always, everything comes out like this, but the reality is, is that um, any new product that takes off is um, you're going to get lots of adoption and that's amazing. Um, there's going to be some winners and some losers. Um, and, you know, if you look at uh, this specific story, guy's an entrepreneur, you know, like, that's the other thing I'll call out. He's doing well. He's doing bounce houses now. Mm -hmm. He basically, they just told a story of an entrepreneur. <laughs> like every entrepreneur has had business ventures they've tried and lost on. I've got them. Right. Um, and you eventually land on one that's successful. And I think he did like, I, so I, I would say like, it's just, it's a new industry. It's taking off and there's going to be um, learning experiences along the way. Yeah, I mean, a, a couple a couple notes here. I think, you know, one, they're basically their, their alpha version, their product accidentally got a bajillion users, right? So like, it wasn't really intentional that they got to the point, the the size that they were. And if you're Bloomberg and your life is tied to the traditional financial system and you have a story about how this new emerging uh, financial tech is the devil, it's a really good hit piece. I mean, it's exactly what you want to, the, the story you want to paint if you're Bloomberg to say, look at all these people who invested into this technology and went and they lost all this money. And, you know, I mean, I think there is, you have to, people have to understand the risks associated with, with Web3. It's not a bank. Don't put your life savings in right. it. Um, it's a game and it's been billed as a game and they happen to also be able to make money. So we've talked about Axie a lot. I I don't think that we need to dwell on this, especially because we have some other things to talk about. Um, but yeah, I mean, I it's clearly the piece is written from a perspective of being Bloomberg and you have a, a desire to Paint, paint, have paint people scared of the web three ecosystem so it makes sense um the incentives make sense okay uh, that was a lot of news more than we do but i guess we Ooh. had two months off okay um <laughs> nate we're pivoting to our main topic uh where we will talk to t hop about his career with a focus on community building because that's something that i think you've done quite a bit of in the past as well as we, we can talk about a little bit how it web wraps into web three so just to kick it off um will you tell us a bit about yourself your background uh, where you work and what you do yeah so I've been in, let's see, the you know tech space for about just over ten years now. Um, I started out in gaming, um, product, and then product marketing, and then performance marketing <laughs> at a company called Rock U. Um, and then from there, I went to a company called Rocket Games, um, which is where I met Bill, the founder of um, Perfect Storm, where I'm at now. Uh, that company was sold. I had up, I had up marketing there, performance marketing there. Um, and that company was sold to uh, Penn National. And when Penn National acquired us, I rolled into Penn National and started doing all of their digital marketing for all their like gambling products too. And when I realized that <laughs> I was helping people become gamblers, uh, once I kind of rolled into that space, I was like, wow, I'm using my marketing abilities to help people do something I don't agree with. Um, and so I, I decided to make a switch from there to go to Lyft. Uh, where I headed up passenger acquisition growth. And from there, I went, um, I did that for about a year. Uh, at Lyft, I learned that um, I like marketing. I'm good at it. Uh, and But I, I really enjoy 
uh, working with people that, you know, I care about. And I also realized that I, I needed a lot of, I needed, I needed to learn a lot about leading. I learned, had led by example, but at that point I was like, I need to learn what real leadership is. So I went to masterclass, um, for about two and a half years where the COO, um, basically gave me a leadership playbook that I, you know, learned from him, read a bunch of books, uh, along the way and incorporated that into masterclass. And while I was there, I realized, wow, I love working at a place that I care about the mission. Both of my parents are teachers. Um, and they taught me that hard work and investing yourself in your education is uh, what you, you know, the only thing you can really, nobody can take from you is your education. So when I went to master class and realized that we were, you know, helping people, um, inspire them to get started with their own <laughs> individual, like learning it, it felt really good. Um, and I actually left there to go help a company called super peer, which was basically making the master class for the rest of us as their, uh, CMO and co-founder, uh, ended up not working out for me in terms of like my, um, the direction I wanted to take the company versus the founder of the company. So parted ways. And now I'm at a company called perfect storm back into gaming. Um, and I'm here because we're building, what we're doing is we're building something that's uh, new and different. We're building a company that I want to be able to say that in, you know, five years, I can say like, wow, everyone here loves working here. Everyone here, um, really enjoys what we're doing and, and making an impact on the gaming community. So I'm the CEO now of perfect storm. And what that means is I do whatever the company needs, you know, from hiring to research to validation of game designs. That's what, that's what I'm up to. Cool. So we want to really drill into the community building component of this uh, and how, you know, most of our listeners are either executives at mobile app, mobile apps or game companies focused on gaming uh, pretty heavily or, or marketing leaders. And so one of the things I want to talk about is just how do we use community as a, a lever for business growth? So I guess like, like start there, like what are the key components and best practices for building community specifically with the focus of making it impactful to a business? Yeah, I think the, the key here is that most people approach it exactly like you're talking about right now. That's exactly how I thought about it when I was at Masterclass um, until I started working with the community team a little more closely. And what I started to realize was that there's people in that group that were running that team that are wired differently than most people. Um, and wired in a way that like, I think all of us wish we could be wired a little more. As entrepreneurs, as business leaders, it's about the bottom line, right? It's about growing the business. It's about making a, a difference. And um, what I basically started to, to see was that, hey, it's about more than that. It's about actually saying, I'm going to make a difference in these people's lives. And so when I joined Perfect Storm, you know, one of the biggest things that I really loved about it is that our, you know, what we're doing is we're making, just, just so everyone knows, like we're making and operating like alternatives to the world's most popular competitive online games. That's what we're doing. We're starting out with a MOBA. And, but what, why we really exist is that um, we want to do what we love and we want to share it with the world. And we want to have a positive impact on the lives of gamers. So much so that we're creating, uh, we're, we're transitioning our company into a public benefit corp. Uh, and I can talk more about what that is, but the reason that we're doing it is because we want to be super intentional. And this goes back to the community building. We want to be very intentional about the fact that, you know, when you build a community, it's not about the give get, it's about the give. And it sounds wild. And it goes back to kind of like the age old thing, like, Hey, the best way to accomplish what you want is to give away what you have. And it's like, how does that make sense? Um, but what I can say from my own experience is that <clears throat> when you give away like your knowledge and you help others and you help them achieve what they what they're looking to achieve or what they how they want to grow it really leaves a lasting impression on them it helps them grow and it also then causes them to then want to also do the same thing for the next person and so what we're doing in our community is we're really saying we want to try and create a system that uh where the groups the, the group of individuals there share a mutual concern for one another's welfare. And so you have to be able to set up a system that allows for that. So it's not just community, like mem like employees of the company pushing. It's how do we get set a system that is going to make it so that each community member is looking out for one another. And so there's different levels of it, but the way that what, the, what, what I would say, the first thing to do is to read a, a book on community. 
um, and community building. And there's a great a one specific by, book. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, there's a great one by Charles Charles Vogel that is on the art of community. Um, and essentially, like the what we're doing to you know take the things that are in that book and put it in the community is we're talking to the community members directly. We open a Discord, we tell people what we're doing, people start to come in and you treat them like humans. You talk to them, you tell them, hey, this is what we're up to. They come in because they're interested in what you're building and then you create a relationship with them. It's a very, very one-to-one, slow growth, um, investing in people and over time it, it creates something special. It's not much different than being an entrepreneur, building a client base. You know, you do great work for them. They refer you to the next person. And so here, what we're doing is we're, we're building those relationships with people. Some of them work for us now. Some of them are in our community as moderators. Some of them are in there in our, what we're calling storm council to basically level up in our community to eventually um, be more involved with our company. And so that the, the biggest thing, if I really just like reiterate is talk to people, identify what they're looking for and help them in that area. Um, and you'll find that the areas that they need help and the areas that you as a company might need help are actually relatively aligned. And you, and because of that, you can both benefit from, from the situation. I, I can give, per, I can give exact examples if you'd like. Sure. So Great example is um, gaming community. If you're starting a gaming community, what are most of these? Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to start out trying to understand what they're looking for. So run a survey, right? Um, do surveys outside of uh, the Discord or outside of your community and say like, what are these people really looking for? This core audience that we're looking to be part of our community. Once you do that, you get a sense for what they're looking for, but then you invite people um, cause, and then they come in, you talk to them. Um, but you create events. So you, in any community, you have to have places where people can get involved without actually saying like, oh, I'm a community member. It's like, oh yeah, sure. I'll show up to this event and do it. So as an example, hey, here's this um, art design. Here's this art version versus this art version. Which one do you like more? Do surveys like that. People give their input. Throw out a, a, a light paper. Hey, we're thinking about doing this. This is a game feature. That's a new development on this product. What do you think? Um, people start to have their, their answers. And then from there, you start the conversation and then you hop on a call with them. And what you'll find is people fall into basic needs. People are looking for either like belonging. It's a big one for gamers, especially MMO players. They're looking for belonging. They're looking for community that they can belong to and feel like they are you know, a part of. They're looking for an identity. They're looking to say like, I am X, Y, Z, you know, I'm a gamer. Um, you know, I'm a dad, I'm a brother. Like they're looking for an identity that is valued. Right. Um, not just like, Oh yeah, I'm a gamer, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, and then the last two they're looking for is like, they're looking for growth in some way. So whether it's financially career better at the game they're playing. Um, and then the last one is a lot of them actually are just looking to contribute to something because when you contribute to something as like a play tester or a designer or a survey filler outer, like when you contribute to something, it feels good. It feels like you're adding value to a product or to something. And so when you identify on those four things, what people are really looking for, everybody's a little bit different. You can start to then include them into different projects or different um, parts of the development of the product. And this is where Web3 is so amazing. By having a product, that is a Web3 product, um, you have a lot of people that want to just be involved with the production of the game while it's being produced rather than waiting till the very end um, and then trying to get all of your customers or members to join. You can actually start to build your, your, your audience along the way. Yeah, that was, that was sort of what I was going to call out as you, as you were describing it was the fact that a lot of these um, components of meaning that you described during this community development process, it it is eerily reminiscent of what seems to be the draw of Web3. I mean, people in Web3 talk about community a lot and on the gaming side as well as not on the gaming side, but a lot of people fold, you know, being a, a crypto investor into their their cultural identity. And I think it's an interesting thing in the times when we're going increasingly, It's I don't think it's a coincidence that the time when Web3 hit its cultural zeitgeist was 
also the time we all happen to be locked up in our houses, right? It's like, I think people right. in, a, in a time when we're really seeking meaning in our life, it, in a, and we're living more of a life on a digital scale, it makes a lot of sense. That also would uh, coincide with when we see these big shifts towards people taking these digital identities and making it part of their, their selves. Um, Warren, do you have any, any additional thoughts here? No, just reflecting on what you guys said. I mean, yeah, I think those basic human needs that, that T Hop spoke to of just things like belonging of status, you know, respect of your peers. And uh, yeah, that, that COVID really accelerated our kind of discovery of new digital versions of these that, you know, is perfectly mapped to like the spike in interest in, in Web3. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of different places I want to take this. I mean, there's sort of like two, two really, really, I think, key questions that I want to dump on. We were talking about gaming, so maybe we'll start there. What is in, in the context of game gaming communities, what do you sort of see as the core difference between a mobile gaming community and a Web3 game community? Is there one that's distinguishable? Is it as simple as saying in Web3, we're more inclusive, we inc include you in the process of the game development? And in mobile, you're just sort of like a person in a Discord, or not, I mean, it wasn't even Discord. Uh, where were most of the Web2 community, uh, mobile, I guess Discord as well, from mobile communities. And like in mo in mobile, it's sort of like a top-down command economy, or is there something that's more nuanced that I'm sort of missing here? Yeah, I think the, the best analogy <clears throat> that I have to give is, um, so first of all, there actually really isn't much of a difference. Sure. There really isn't. Okay, um, that's the answer. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the real line is like, at the start of the frenzy of Web3, there was a difference because it was about people trying to make money based off of FOMO, getting in early, having economies that were built on the first people that got in, made money. And that is not sustainable. Nope. Um, and so as the more and more game developers rather than crypto people come into this space to look at the possibilities in this and really evaluate game economies, um, it starts to be, look a lot more like a mobile or a, a desktop product right. um, with some features that I would say help the help with the distribution and development of the product um, during like that design and build phase. Right. And so as and what I like to say is um, the best analogy I have for this is that, you know, the current infrastructure for gaming, the way that it's set up is. Um, the biggest difference is that, you know, in you, if you live in a community, right, a normal community you live in, there's people that will rent an apartment. There's people that will rent condos from, you know, individual owners. And then there's people that will own their home. And so you have kind of the, the gamut of different people. And then you have some people that are on like subsidized housing, basically being provided for by the government. And what I would say is what we're moving into is a place where, you have a community where you have people in every different aspect of that. In the gaming community right now that are non-Web3 products, everybody is basically either there for free or a renter. Right. And what you'll notice in communities is if you're in a community where a lot of the people are owning their home, it ends up feeling a lot more like a strong community where people invest in the community, they invest in the neighborhood, they show up to, to meetings um, for the neighborhood. And so, and they, they care about the future of what that community looks like. Um, and that's what I would say is the distinction here is that as you're building this community, you have people that are interested in the future of what it looks like and, and investing their time into it a little bit more than you would if you were a, a non web three product. Right. I mean, that, that makes a, a bunch of sense. Okay, um, I think I want to sort of take this from the other perspective, and I want to talk a little about uh, community uh, in situations like Super Peer and or Masterclass, where community is the product. And I know, I think this is probably part of the reason why maybe you moved on from those, based on what the conversations you have now, maybe that's part of the reason why you've moved on from those companies. But I, I want to talk a little bit about what is the mindset that goes into developing a community as a product. And I guess like there's two, two components of it. I, I am quite curious about like how you think about it from an ethical perspective but then the flip side of that is like how do you think about it from a performance perspective are there ways to put metrics around community performance in a way to like sort of tie it back to what you said at the top like business objectives yeah so i'll touch on i'll touch on super peer real quick so super peer was a was a platform that was designed to unlock human knowledge 
right? Sure. So as a YouTube example, right? You watch a YouTuber and you're like, wow, that person has a lot of information on this topic that I'm interested in. Let's say it's growing plants. Um, and you're like, I can't understand why my plant's dying. You Google it, you watch YouTube videos, you can't find this exact plant. Could it be the water? Could it be the soil? What, what's going on? Um, on Superpeer, the idea is you can just hop on there and like literally contact the YouTuber that was talking about this plant and be like, hey, I've got a specific question for you. I need your help. And from there uh, and pay for their time. And that would be like a faster way than sitting there watching, you know, a lot of YouTube videos, to try and find it. And, and then even in the end, still being like, all right, I still don't know the answer. Um, so the reason to use money as an exchange for this value um, is to get things started, right? Like to get people to start to realize, hey, this is great. I can monetize my knowledge in another way other than making YouTube videos or another way other than being an influencer. Um, and so money, in my opinion, gives the community members that incentive to help each other and look out for one another. And in the long run, what I believe happens is you start to see that, hey, I actually like doing this more than just for the money. In the same way that every single one, you know, leader has seen, wow, when I develop an employee and they go on and have an amazing career and support their family, that's like the best feeling in the world. And so Super Peer was a way to kind of like start to get that ability for people to contribute to each other. And so it, back to your question on like, are you able to associate performance metrics with like community growth? And I would say um, not performance metrics. What I would say is more like brand style of metrics where you're not tracking just yet. Like, um, like, you know, what I mean by that is it's not directly related. It's more of like a monthly survey, you know, with brand metrics, you're looking at, Hey, how did our brand awareness grow? And you're surveying the community, you're surveying the audience in here. What I would say is your, your biggest metric is for a community is like, am I having a positive impact on the lives of others? Am I delivering on the thing that we have set out to say our community's purposes in terms of how we're planning on serving and actually, and, and, and valuing that. So what we're doing is you have a, we're setting up a survey. We haven't started it yet. Um, but this is something we're planning on doing, um, is, and which is why we're f finally getting the public benefit going and everything, but is asking them like perfect storm has had a positive impact on my life. Strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree tracking that on a monthly basis to see, are we, are we improving or not? And so that's just a very basic way of looking at it from a metrics perspective, but it's not something that I would say that you would have something on a, like a, you know, performance, performance, uh, marketing style of metric that you'd be looking at. T hop on that note, one thing I'd love to get your opinion on being so deep in this space, uh, a trend I've seen in the last few months, I'm sure you've seen as well is these sort of gamified, uh, discord currencies in different ways that are like rewarding and measuring uh, different types of, of engagement. So like um, there's one called crew3.xyz uh, that one of our partners, Arrivent, is using. And I'm curious if you see these as like uh, maybe a way to approximate and like get some metrics around engagement, or if you think that this is sort of like artificially, uh, like it basically is this like healthy incentivization or uh, unhealthy incentivization? And just what's your take on that segment of, of products and discord currencies? I, I uh, so all of those incentivized systems um, are, if they're incentivized around leveling up so that you could get a, a token or you could get a NFT, um, and that's kind of the goal of the reason to like level up is it, for that purpose, then I believe they're, they're designed in the wrong way with the wrong incentive with mm -hmm. like basically the feeling of FOMO to make money, to get in early. If you look at all these discords, it's like, get in, get in now. There's a, there's a drop, there's a get on the white list. And I think that it's a way to monitor and track something that is a, a very short-term focus. Um, and you know, if I, if I go back to like the, the oldest communities, right. What are the oldest communities right now? The oldest communities are the, the religious communities. They've been around for <laughs> thousands of years and they've sustained so much, you know, so, so much. And, you know, uh, the only incentive that they have is really like, basically all of them is like, help your neighbor. <laughs> like, you well, know, don't go to hell. <laughs> Yeah, don't go to hell, but it's it's, it's a strong it's, incentive. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's it's based around, you know, being a good person, helping each other. 
And so when you try to incentivize things with money or incentivize things with, you know, um, NFTs or like the, the, the purpose is, is off. And so what I would really encourage people to be thinking about is like, if you're going to be using those systems, great, but build them in a way that are incentivizing the right thing that you want, even if it means you're going to grow slower. Um, because if you make a great game, it's going to take off for its entertainment value. And if people have, if people are benefiting from things outside of the entertainment, like feeling more feeling of belonging, more feeling of identity, more feeling of growth, and, and actually you're helping and people in there are helping each other grow, then it's going to be sustainable. It's going to, it's going to stick around. Um, and so it's really important that you set it up in that way rather than using it to say, hey, if you do this, you're going to get this NFT, or if you do this, you're going to get this, you know, thing that then signifies um, something that has some future value. It shouldn't be that at all. If anything, it should be something that has more to do with identity and more to do with like what your role in the community is. As an example, hey, if you make it to this level, now you're a gatekeeper or now you're somebody that can invite others to this community um, and allow them to actually, you know, and have a strong vetting process. Make sure that you agree with the community members. And something that Lyft did um, when they were building the company is the one, this sounds funny, but like they had a tap, they, they interviewed every single individual driver um, in the same way that you interview an employee, it wasn't transactional. It was like you interview them. And the question that they would all have to say that they, this person passes, would I let this person drive my little sister around? And if they pass and they got it, they got to drive. So I'd say it's like, it's a very one-to-one, um, do this person, does this person have the values for therefore, do I want to elevate them in my community in the same way that I say like church organizations do? Yeah. I mean, I guess to, to your point, T-Hop, it, it, having these incentivized systems, it kind of depends on what you do with them. You know, if you're, if you're making the actions very transactional or encouraging like discord grinding, uh, obviously that's not going to lead to legitimate community, but uh, you could also use things uh, such as like incentivizing, you know, introducing yourself to the community or uh, making some content, you know, about, about the project uh, or mentoring someone, you know, I think there's, it, it, you'll kind of, these are just kind of frameworks. And I think, communities will evolve. Like a few months ago, there was tons of incentivization of just like grind, chat a lot in Discord. And that trend is almost completely gone now because surprise, that doesn't lead to like le legit engaged communities. So I think we're seeing both the mindset and the tooling um, for you know, true engaged, uh, robust communities quickly evolving. Yeah, I 100% I agree. It's incentivizing the right, the right actions. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what you want to be doing. But um, how to do that right and have it still feel authentic and genuine is a really, really fine line um, that, you know, we're, as an example, give the NFT away and have that NFT be a badge that they can like wear proudly. Um, don't sell it. Don't, you know, have any monetization set up, you know, connected to it. Um, so there's, it has to be very intentional about making sure that it's very clear of what the purpose is of it. Um, but I do agree with, you want to incentivize the right behavior um, and let people really understand, oh, this is how I act. This, this is how I should, should be in this community. This is what they care about. This is what they value. Great. Well, um, thank you for all the insight around community building. Is there anything you want to say as you wrap up this topic before we move on to our app of the week segment? Yeah, I'll just leave it with this. Um, slow growth. Community slow building is about slow growth. It's not about turning some, you know, turning the tap on and, and then all of a sudden having everybody else turn on the tap too. It's about slow growth. It's one-on-one -on -one, It's one -on -one relationships and that's how you build a community. And it's about helping people with the thing that they're looking for and get, and allowing yourself and your team and, your, and the other community members to help them with that thing. Makes sense. Awesome. So we'll move on to our last section, which is app of the week. Uh, Warren, do you have an app this week? I do have an app this week, Sander. I, I correctly guessed what your app of the week was, so I had to go with my, my backup, uh, which is a kind of bizarre one today. It's very practical. So I just moved. I moved across the country to uh, Collingswood, New Jersey, and uh, I was trying to figure out like the whole trash recycling composting system out here. I found a very simple but very helpful app called Recycle Coach. 
so this is basically an app that will give you reminders for you know whenever there's pickup of a different item, including like the weird like large item pickups that are handled different in every city. If there's a holiday, it'll let you know like when when the shifted days are. Uh, and you can also look up like uh, you know I have uh, you know I have like a bunch of plastic bags. You know you can you can look up any item or take a picture of an item, and it will tell you in your community how you're supposed to deal with that that trash item. I've moved a lot over the you know the last decade, and every time going to a different city or different state, completely different rules around recycling, composting, and I do my best to not be a jerk and try to do the right thing with that stuff. So very simple app that's not going to eat up a lot of brain space, uh, but will make your life and uh, the world uh, incrementally a little better by, by using. Interesting. Xander, do you have an app <laughs> this week? <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, an interesting app. Very niche. It might be our second most niche app after the mushroom identification app. I did that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my app is uh, sort of unsurprisingly Diablo Immortal. So Diablo Immortal is the new game by Blizzard uh, in partnership with NetEase, a Chinese gaming giant. Uh, and it's a free-to-play version of Diablo. And if you've been on the internet uh, recently, you may have heard that it's terrible and everyone should everyone should feel terrible for playing it. Um, and I'm sort of joking, but that's like sort of the sentiment. It has one of the lowest user reviews on Metacritic of like any game ever, by far the lowest of, of um, any Blizzard game. And uh, the sort of key reason why is because it's a freemium game, right? It has free to play, uh, free to play game mechanics. Now, here's the thing: it's actually an incredibly, incredibly well done game. Uh, it is the, basically the best, in my opinion, the best Twitch gameplay on phone that I've ever done. I don't do a ton of Twitch gameplay, but uh, it's an incredibly well done Twitch gameplay. The game is fun. The story is, I mean, it's Diablo. It's like not a super sophisticated story, but there's great cutscenes. Uh, you have dynamic worlds where like you know during boss battles will bring down the ceiling on you you'll be jumping off cliffs and like doing all sorts of crazy you know triple a animations which are incredibly good uh and at least i'm level 44 out of 60 i'm probably 20 to 25 hours in and i, I paid for the the pass the like uh what is it called game pass but like there's definitely no need to pay uh anything early on and the reality is uh you get a ton like dozens and dozens of hours of incredibly good gameplay for free and it's big i think it might be like the most high quality mobile game i've ever played like frankly i mean it's i'm only 20 hours in or whatever but that's a lot of freaking hours and somehow like what's happened is because of the very very high end if you want the top tier of gems for the top for like the one percent of one percent who are going to get to the end game you have to uh, basically in, invest pretty heavily into what is called the crests which are pretty expensive which have facilitate the dropping of special drops which empower the highest tier of equipment um you kind of have to pay a lot and the numbers are are sort of all replaced they're saying between 50 and five hundred thousand dollars to get to a, a max level character um i don't know if those numbers are right you could you can definitely make an argument for that those numbers are you know fairly accurate but like you got to realize like these are like the one percent one percent like 99.9 percent .9 people are never going to get to even that that point of the end game and so i really am like sort of he scratching my head about this it's like basically the best free to play mobile game i've played in years and somehow it has like the worst review of anything of any mobile game i've seen in a while and it's it's just very bizarre to me because it's really freaking good go play the other mortal <laughs> <laughs> it's it's almost as if the community was going to complain about it no matter what the end product was yeah because yeah. anyone who's played the game it seems to have a sentiment very akin to to what you say. I mean, I've played a bit. I'm not as deep as you, but yeah, it, it feels like a masterpiece for yeah. for a mobile game. Um, but there was the, the pitchforks were already out in Sharpen before this game came out, and I think they were determined to be to be used. Uh, everyone that seems to have spent actually spent time playing um, seems to say the same thing. The game's extremely generous with what you can do for free. There's not a gun to your head telling you that you have to spend money in the game. You, if you really want to flex and go all in, cool, you can, but no one's making you do that. T Hop, have you have you messed around with Diablo Immortal? No, I haven't yet. Yeah. Not yet. Cool. So, so that's don't, that's don't, my don't rant. let the haters don't let the haters scare you. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I've been playing Catalyst Black a lot. What's that? Cool. It, it's a it's a mm it's a MOBA um, that is shooter based, um, but it's still super have... evil, right? Super Evil Mega Corp. Yep, they're the 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 Vanglory guy, Vanglory guys. Um, that they this is their next title. I like it. It's fun. Um, I played four hours last night. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a it's a fun title. I I uh, 
The one that I I'll, I'll throw out there is, for my app is the Outbound. Um, it's actually by a friend of mine. Oh, cool. Um, but it basically is it's you'll be surprised. Put your city in, or just like go to it. It'll give you outside things to do that you didn't know existed that are like within miles of your house, okay. and it's crowdsourced. Oh, awesome crowdsource things to do it's got people's descriptions comments it's not run by like a big government corporation it's run by like a 10 person team and i can tell you i whenever i'm in a new town i want to go for a run or a hike or i pop this op- open and i'm like wow i didn't like this is good and i've done it in my own town in my own city in san diego i'm like this is these are great suggestions and great. so i love this app they also do um like events where you can go and you know, be with a bunch of other people that enjoy outdoors and hiking, camping, exploring. And so I, I really like this product. It's something that I, I'm surprised isn't like crazy popular, but it's, it's the locations are feel very like hidden and good. And, and it, the descriptions on them are great. I'm a connoisseur of outdoor apps, so I'm definitely going to check this out. I've been using Onyx. I went backpacking last uh, last weekend, mm-hmm. and uh, we use Onyx Backpack just to like make sure we didn't get lost in the woods. So I'll definitely definitely check this one out. This one's fun to find the locations. It's not the one to like use while you're like hiking, you know, yeah. or while you're at that at that location. I mean, it's got stuff like beaches. It's got stuff hiking, walking trails, biking, you know, all kinds of things. So awesome, great great one. Definitely check that one out. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for joining us. Uh, very excited to be back. Uh, Thomas, if people want to find you, um, where can they get a hold of you? Yeah, the best way is actually just on LinkedIn. Um, that's the fastest way to get a hold of me. Um, so I'm <clears throat> Thomas Hopkins, and it's slash T Hop, I believe it is, or T Hopkins is what I believe it is, or T Hopkins 11, if you find me. But yeah, you'll, you'll see there on LinkedIn. It's the best way to get a hold of me. Or check out the website, perfectstorm.gg. Perfectstorm.gg. You can also check out a video um, where I'm on there and talking. My my son makes a cameo, so yeah, uh, you can also check out our website. But I don't know if I have my my email address there. So, but the, if you want to email me directly, it's it's Thomas at Perfectstorm.gg. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Warren, do you want to take us out? Sure thing. Yeah, T Hop. Thank you so much. It was really awesome having you on here. We know, you know, you know, you've, we've been trying to get a hold of you to come on for a while and uh, really excited to see what you and the team do at Perfect Storm um, with, with some of your leadership uh, uh, philosophies and seeing what those mean when, you know, having a really robust team and working in the Web3 space. I think it's going to be a company to watch for sure. So as always, the episode today was brought to you by the team at Uptick. Uh, here at Uptick, we help games and apps of all sizes grow. Uh, everything from pre-product uh, Web3 games that are just building their initial communities and um, you know, employing like an organic growth strategy to build really solid communities to apps that are launched in a mass appeal stage where we're bringing in uh, tens of millions of, of users in a sustainable and profitable way uh, for, for our partners. So if you need help with anything related to that from creative to uh, data science and prediction to user acquisition, feel free to reach out to us. You can reach us at uptick.com. That's U-P-P-T-I-C.com. Talk soon.